going on, church family? How's everyone doing tonight? How's everyone doing tonight? Ready to praise the Lord? In Him we are here. Amen? All right, let's go before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for bringing us here together, Father, to fellowship. Father, to hear more about you, Father. Father, it says in your word, draw near to me and I will draw near to you, Father. We want to draw near to you, Father. Because, Father, the closeness that we desire from you is on the other side of I don't feel like reading my Bible, Father. It's on the other side of I don't feel like praying, Father. Because, Father, we are here to grow closer to you, Father. And whatever that means, Father, help us to just lose everything else that's not from you. It says to keep in your word, to keep our mind off of worthless things, Father. Help us to stay focused on you, what needs to be done in your name and not our own, Father. Because, Father, we are here on this earth because we're just waiting for you, Father. So, Lord, we give these praises up to you. Praise, Father, we uh, you ask that you just bless this time of worship. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Bow at his feet, he has done great. 
everybody, come on. The last is the battle. You see my
never compare to how big God is, how powerful God is. So let me repeat that. I'm going to say it again. So we, so we plan it in our heart, not just our mind. So Jeremiah 51, 15 says, He made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, and spread out the heavens by his understanding. Let's sing this next song. I praise the Lord when everything is failing. I praise the Lord when I am weak. When everything is falling down around me, my heart sings praises to my
that is who you are. You're a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are.
shine on darkest night For all that you've done we will pour out your love This will be a random song Jesus we
Lord, would we praise you not just with our mouths, Lord, but with our hearts, Lord. Let our hearts be true to you, God. And what you say is that you give us a pure heart, God. So let us receive that pure heart and put it into place of that old heart, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless the message, bless everything ahead of us, Lord. Bless the rest of our night. We don't know if we're going to be taken tonight. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, Lord, but you, God, have it all in your hand. Lord, I pray that we would not feel like we're too far from you, but we would just know that you're right here, God. You tell us where two or more are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst, Lord. You are here. Your Holy Spirit is here, God. Let us believe that. Father, I pray that you would just help our hearts to be desperate. To be desperate for the moments of worship, for the moments of you, God. You're not just moments, you're in every single part of our life. So, Lord, let us be confident, Lord, in that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good evening, South Bay. Great to see you guys. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, as well as Exodus chapter 20. So we got some Exodus going on tonight, Hebrews chapter 10. If you need a Bible, there should be one in the seat back pocket in front of you. Now, how many of you are inviting a friend to Harvest Fest uh, on October 31st? Who's inviting a friend? Okay, great. Who's inviting, uh, like, a family to come out on Harvest Fest? There you go. Well, I, I got to let you know, Pastor Zach's son is on the San Pedro football club team. And, um, the, well, let me say, I shouldn't say football club team. That's like a double whatever. He's on the, their football club. And yesterday, he invited his whole team and all their families to come to Harvest Fest. So let me tell you something. For a nine-year-old to say to all of his team members, you need to come and know about Jesus at Harvest Fest, that's a big deal. So I think if he can do it, you can do it. Amen? All right. And listen, if you've not volunteered, I'm sure that you would love the experience of working alongside this incredible team. So just make sure that you figure out how you can be a part. We'd love to see you here serving. Um, all right. Hebrews chapter 10 and Exodus chapter 20. For those of you who are wondering, am I going to get to the controversial part of Hebrews chapter 10? No. We're not going to get there this week. We will get there next week. So all of you that couldn't wait to meet me in the lobby to contradict what I had to say, come next week. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hebrews chapter 10, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I'm just so grateful for this Thursday night crew that just continues to grow because they hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, it's amazing to me that through the book of Hebrews... You are changing lives one life at a time. I'm so grateful for your word. Even difficult passages. Because Lord, that's our faith. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's joyful. But it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Because greater is he that is within us than he that's in the world. And so, Lord, I just pray tonight that you'd help us put on spiritual ears and a spiritual mind and a spiritual heart to receive what you want to speak to us. It's in Jesus' name I pray all God's people said. Amen. 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 I told you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, but I want you to look up a couple of verses at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Because in chapter 9... We learned an important law or an important rule that God established. Hebrews chapter 9, would you take a look? Verse 22, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness unless blood is shed. Let me explain. According to God, the penalty of sin is is death. 
He makes it very clear in Hebrews chapter 9. And when Adam sinned, a lamb was killed by God to cover over Adam and Eve as they walked into their world. God killed an animal and covered over Adam and Eve as they walked into their world. Literally, they were covered by the blood of this animal as they walked out into this new world of sin. Well, this would become the pattern instituted by the law of God in the Old Testament. You see, God wanted a relationship with the nation Israel. And that relationship is a forever forever covenant. It's a relationship that he has established. But because we sin, because man sinned, and because there's sin in the world, like Adam, he had to cover over their sinful state with blood, or the death of a lamb. It's called the sacrifices, or the burnt offerings, or the peace offerings. And with that understanding, take a look, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Per the law, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. In other words, because it was repeated year after year after year, they were constantly conscious that they were guilty. Verse 3, But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. There we see the reason for the Day of Atonement. It was to remind the children of Israel, year after year, you're a sinner. Verse 4, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. With 2,000 years of church history, it's really difficult for understand what's happening in verses one through three. It's really difficult for us to understand and, and grab what the first century Jew was hearing for the first time. I mean, after all, whether we're in church, whether we're in our car, whether we're at work, all we know is when we say, dear Jesus, we're in the presence of God. None of us think twice about it. None of us are, oh, I don't know if I can go before the Lord. Now, if you're in sin, you probably will wonder. But if you're not in sin and you're not practicing sin, as soon as you say, dear Jesus, you know you're ushered right into the presence of God. We're 2,000 years into Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 and 3. But for the first century Jew, this group, they had no concept of our reality. I'm going to prove it to you. Go with me to Exodus. Keep your finger in Hebrews 10. We're going to come back. Go with me to Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, Moses has gone up to Mount Sinai, and the people are at the base of the mountain. Now, when God shows up on Mount Sinai, it's a big deal, okay? Take a look, Exodus chapter 20. Let's see how God used to show up in Exodus during the Old Covenant. Take a look, Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed, or they saw on top of the mountain, the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, uh, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. And it's so great we come to church, there's lights, a little guitar. And we come, and it's like, oh, we're going to worship Jesus. And some of us hold our hands like this. Some of us do this. Some of us, we're just like, the, we're just like the, this, you know. Some of us are the one fingers. Like, we're just like, you know, we're just cool. That's just what we are. Some of us are the pocket worshipers, you know. And some of us are the swears. I'm a swear. 
I, I'm a swayer. I don't know about you, but when I worship, I like to sway. Some of you are the dancers, okay? Some of you are like David. You will become even more undignified than this. Like, you will just worship God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, okay? Amen? Amen. Because there's lights, there's a little drum. You got Nina over here, and she's just doing her. Don't you love the way she holds her mic? It's like, she just, you know, she's just like doing this thing. I just love watching her lead worship. I mean, she was right here in my, and it's like, whoa. Okay, not so in the Old Testament. You didn't show up to church with lights and every deal, okay? God showed up, and there was lightning. There was thundering. The mountain was on fire and smoke was coming up. So the children of Israel said, Moses, we got a great idea. You go ahead and go talk to God. <laughs> and then you speak to us. And if you survive all of that, God bless you. Oh, I'm telling you. Imagine being at the base of that mountain. And Moses says, listen, God is testing you because he wants you to fear him. And I'm concerned in the 21st century that we've lost a little bit of that fear. And I wonder if God showed up today there on Big Bear, and we were looking out, and all of a sudden Big Bear goes on fire and lightning is striking, and what would you do? Pastor Chet, you go on up. <laughs> you go talk to God and let us know what he's got to say. We're going to watch. And if you don't fry on the way up, God bless you, Chet, you just keep going. See, the children of Israel... They were very aware of the consequence of their sin. And the consequence of their sin, they said, don't let God speak with us lest we die. They knew they were sinners. They also knew that they were guilty of sin and couldn't approach God. Now, we in the 21st century, we've been forgiven. The blood of Jesus has covered us. We say, dear Jesus, we're in the presence of God. But for the Jew, look at their perspective. You go ahead, Moses. We're good. And Moses would bring down the law, and he brought it to the people. Do you remember when Moses came down the mountain? He was shining like Casper the ghost. So he had to cover his head. He had to cover his head so that people wouldn't be so afraid of him. Can you imagine one time I come out from the back? <laughs> shine a little light on me, and I've got the glory of Jesus, but it's actually just the glory of the light that's shining on me. That's the point. The light of God was reflecting off of Moses. I need to let you know something. According to Hebrews chapter 10, the law was just a shadow. The law was just a photograph, an image of the real deal. Now, that's something for us to stop and think about for just a moment. You see, when I go on a trip and I take my iPhone with me, sometimes when it's been like three, four, five days, okay, I'll start going through my pictures. Oh, there's me and Andrea. Oh, there's me and Sela. Oh, there's me and Timon. Oh, there's me and my grandkids. Oh, look, this is so sweet. Look at, look at. Look at all those pictures. And I love to have the pictures. And I, it makes me miss them. But let me tell you something. When I'm away and I start missing them, I don't want the picture as much as I want them beside me. The law was just a picture. It was a photograph. It was a shadow. And the author is giving us a vivid picture here of what the law represents. Now, let me explain. The light of God shining on Jesus, listen carefully, cast a shadow on the earth of what Jesus would fulfill, the law. The light of God shining on Jesus cast a shadow on the earth, and it was called the law, and Jesus would fulfill it. Because Jesus didn't come to end the law. That's what he says in Matthew 5. He came to fulfill the law. The law was a picture of what you needed to be in order to go to heaven. The law was perfect. Everything you need to be to be in the presence of God is the law. 
The law is not good. We're the problem. We're sinners. And so the law was a shadow of what Jesus would fulfill. He lived the perfection because he knew that we couldn't. The law is not the image of Jesus. It reveals what he would fulfill for our sakes because he knew that we couldn't. So the law was given to show us what we needed to be. And it basically showed us we needed a savior because there's no way that any one of us could have fulfilled it. The law could not make the worshiper perfect. There was no way that the law could allow us into God's presence because we were born into sin. That's why there was a veil between the holy place and the most holy place, and only the priest could go in one time a year with bells on in case he had sin on him so that they could pull him out in the event because no one else would go in. It was restricted. And the very fact that they had to offer sacrifice year after year after year was simply a reminder to them, you are sinful. The law does not satisfy the sin debts. It only covers over like I did for Adam and Eve. The law was a shadow, but God had a plan. Have you ever wondered why Jesus waited so long? Well, God waited so long to send Jesus. Have you ever wondered that? Like, why did God wait so many thousand years? Like, okay, I understand. Like, okay, we need to see what sin is. We need to see what heartache is. We need to recognize that we'd rather be in heaven than on earth. But have you ever wondered why God waited so long to send Jesus? Think of this. There's the fall of Adam and Eve. We wait 2,000 years, and then God speaks to Abraham. We wait another 500 years, and God gives the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. We wait 1,500 more years until the ministry of Jesus, and now we're waiting 2,000 plus years for the second coming of Christ. Now, I know how I would prefer this. Adam falls. 20 minutes later, Christ comes. 20 minutes later, Christ comes again. We are in glory, and we don't have to worry about all of the sin issues even that we're experiencing in a sinful world today. That's how I would prefer it. But in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible makes it very clear, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. You see, Paul lets us know there was an appointed time. In fact, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, as I said last week, we see the timeline of world history through the Jewish nation. And Daniel was told by God, there is 70 weeks appointed for you and your people. We are living in that particular time. And on the 69th week, well, uh, 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 what happened? Oh, the Savior is cut off. In other words, he is crucified. We're just simply waiting for that last week. And the reason why it's not mentioned in the book of Daniel is because the church is the mystery revealed in the New Testament. He was speaking to the Jewish people. Can I tell you? That's all we know. I don't know why Jesus waited so long. I know that's probably not the answer that you wanted. Some theologians, they say, well, because there were Roman roads and there was one language around the world and it was the perfect time for Jesus to come. But I think our perspective of time is different than the creator of it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, this is God's perspective. Remember, God created time. God created time. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question to help you make sense of this. How many of you wish Jesus would like come right now? How many of you wish Jesus would come right now? Okay, amen. Now here's my second question. How many of you that raised your hands still have 
loved ones that don't know Jesus. So are we all saying we want them left behind? Do you mean God cares for them more than we do? Here's my point. God is not going to send his son until the last of the Gentiles are saved. And don't you hope that he waits just long enough so your auntie can come to know Christ. Don't you wait just, don't you hope just, he waits just long enough so your grandmother can come to Christ. Don't you hope he waits just long enough so your mom or your brother or your dad can come to Christ? Because I know we're all excited to be with the Lord, but the Lord desires that all people are saved. And so he's going to pursue people until the last of the Gentiles is saved. Now listen, if you're the last of the Gentiles and you're here today, could you come to Jesus? Because let me tell you, how many of us are sick and tired of the sin that we see in this world? We live in a sinful world. And some theologians have said the reason why he's waited is to show us that we desire heaven more than we desire this earth. I'll never forget when Jehovah's Witness showed up to my mom's house. I was like, dude, leave. I'm telling you. And my mom's a Bahamian, so she invited him in for tea. And I'm like, bro, leave you and your buddy get out. Never forget this. I'm like 12 years old. So they got into a doctrinal debate. And I don't know if you know this, but I call my mother the prophetess. They got into a doctrinal debate. The prophetess in the Bible, her name was Hulda. My mom is like super Hulda, okay? I'm just telling, telling you. So then they get so frustrated and flustered. They said, well, we have to go now. <laughs> So they're walking out the door, and they turn, and they ask my mother a question. They say to her, I'll never forget this. I'm like 9, 10, 11. I don't know how old. I'm so old now, I don't remember years or what, how old I was. So I remember them walking out, and they looked at my mom, and they go, don't you want to inherit the earth? In Florida, where we were living at the time, they have bufo frogs. Have you ever heard of bufo frog? It's a big, nasty demonic, <laughs> like literally the frog can be this big and it's poisonous. So if your dog bites it, your dog dies, okay? So, but when they would get hit, they would, there's a Bahamian song, bullfrog it raining, don't go across that road. Um, and when the frog, when it's raining, the frogs try to jump across the road, but the cars don't care about the frogs. So they kill the frogs. They smell so bad. When they are rotting in the street, they're worse than a skunk. They're worse than a skunk. By the way, I got to tell you guys a secret, but only for Thursday, okay? I don't know if you know this. Last Sunday, last Saturday night, I was walking my dog. It was 11 o'clock. He bit a skunk. We walked into it. I got sprayed. My two dogs got sprayed. We were up until 3 a.m. cleaning skunk. That's why I didn't go to the foyer. If you would have hugged me, you would have thrown up. <laughs> I still smell it on me, okay? Now, there's a point in all of this. Listen carefully. And I'm not telling the weekend crowd that, okay? Just the Thursday night crowd, okay? Now, here's the deal. When the Jehovah's Witness said to my mother, and they said to her, don't you want to inherit the earth? There's a dead bufo frog, and you could smell it. And my mom went, are you kidding me? You can have this earth. Do you smell that bufo frog? Have it for yourself. I mean, God bless you. You're going to be left behind during the rapture anyway. And then my mom prayed for them as they left the door. Now listen, I know we all want to be with Jesus, but he still has people to save. We've got to recognize that our perspective is not God's perspective. So Hebrews chapter 10 now, let's pick it up. Go back with me if you would. Hebrews chapter 10, let's pick it up in verse 5. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said. So at God's determined time, he comes into the world. 
And the author is about to record something for us that's not recorded in the Gospels of something that Jesus said. It's Psalm chapter 40 that he's about to quote, and it's a messianic psalm. So let's go into it. It's now Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come in the volume of the book it's written to me to do your will, O God. He quotes Psalm chapter 40, and Psalm chapter 40 is what we call a messianic psalm. It's a psalm about Jesus. But realistically, according to Psalm 40, the entire Bible is about Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. And I would challenge you in your devotions. I would take the book of Psalms, take a year to go through the book of Psalms along with your other uh, uh, devotional schedule, and find Jesus in every psalm. You will be shocked and surprised. Every psalm reflects Jesus in it, not just the messianic psalms. Now, he says this, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Maybe you want to circle that word for just a moment because I want to help it understand what the word desire means. It means will. It means intention. It means purpose. So what he's saying here, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, he says the intention or the will of God was never that dead bulls could save you. That's what he says up in verse 4. For it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Bulls and goats can only cover over sin, just like God covered over Adam walking out of the garden. They can't cover, they can only cover over, but they can't take away sins. When God gave Noah seven rules in Genesis chapter 9, I need you to understand the law that was existent prior to Moses. And in Genesis chapter 9, you'll see on the screen, surely for your lifeblood, speaking to Noah, I'll demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I'll require it from the hand of man. So if a beast kills a beast, the beast needs to die. If a man kills a man, the man needs to die. From the hand of every man's brother, I'll require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made them. And here's what he's saying. Here's the law of God to Noah prior to Moses. Someone's got to die if they cause death. Do you know that Adam brought death into the world? Therefore, Jesus says, a body was prepared for me. Man brought death, and God didn't want man to pay the price. So a body was prepared for the Son of God so that he could pay the price for us. What we're going to do now is we're going to read through Romans chapter 5. Now listen, you can turn there in your Bibles, but I'm going to read it for you in the New Living Translation. Because I believe this translation, it just kind of helps us understand more like a commentary exactly what is being communicated. Now take a look. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Did you hear that? When Adam ate the fruit and did what God told him not to do, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone. For everyone sinned. In other words, we're born into sin. As people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. In other words, no one knew that it was sin because there was no law to say this is sin. Still, everyone died. In other words, the repercussion of sin was still happening. Because when you've got sin, you've got death. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. The result of sin is death. Now, Adam's a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. So a man 
brought death. Jesus says, a body was prepared for me. So he says, but there's a great difference. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. A body was prepared. His name is Jesus. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. So Adam brings death, but look what Jesus brings. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we're guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph. Take a listen to this. Will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Let the church say Now, if you didn't understand that, let me explain. Adam sinned, death came in. So a body was prepared for Jesus so that he would die and take the penalty of our sin so that he alone can offer life to everyone. The God-man Jesus Christ would redeem us by his own life. This was always the plan. A body being prepared for Jesus. Take a look at Revelation 13, 8. Don't think when Adam sinned, God went, oh my goodness, what, what, we got to come up with a new plan now. <laughs> got to get rid of the garden. We got to cover him up. They all think they're naked. This is quite embarrassing. No, no, no. This is not what happened because God's an all-knowing God. So the Bible reveals to us in Revelation chapter 13, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In, all, in other words, it was always God's plan that a man, the God-man, Jesus, would die for man to pay the price of what man brought death. So God did not desire his will, his intention, his purpose was not burnt offerings. His purpose was always the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ. But there's another word I want you to see here. It's the word pleasure. He says this, we'll take a look at six, verse 6, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. In other words, the sacrificial system did not satisfy the requirement to pay the price of our sin. The sacrificial system didn't satisfy. It covered over, but didn't satisfy. You see, Jesus knew what would pay the ransom because he knew the will of God. Jesus knew the will of God, and the will of God was to die. So he says, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, you've no pleasure. But then I said, behold, I've come in the volume of the book it's written of me to do your will, O God. Well, Paul lets us know what the will of God was. It's Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father. The will of God, what would please God, what would satisfy the debt of sin is that Jesus Christ would pay the price of our sin. And by paying the price, John lets us know, it's 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He himself is the propitiation. I practice that word all day long. That's a big word for he paid the ransom. Okay? If you thought I was speaking tongues, I just give the gift of interpretation. I'm not going to say the word again. <laughs> for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In other words, you can't keep this good news to yourself. Your auntie needs Jesus before the rapture of the church. Your grandma needs Jesus before the rapture of the church. Your grandma's probably why you're here. Your brother needs Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you. We've been saved. The ransom has been paid in full. God got everything needed. He was completely pleased and satisfied with the death of Jesus Christ. The point is this. He came to do what God wanted him to do. His life was set apart 
for this task. And I need you to pay attention to that. He came to do what God told him to do. His life was sanctified, set apart for the task of dying for our sins. And Jesus is setting a great example for us. It's John chapter 17, verse 19. John 17, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. I got a job to do, and my job is to do the will of God. I got a job to do, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Now, I could go on verse after verse to prove this, because the whole Bible is about Jesus. By him doing God's will, we get to be sanctified. There's nothing you can do. But because he chose to do God's will, what the writer is trying to prove to the first century Jew and to you and to I, Jesus paid the price and God is pleased. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8, previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offering for sins you did not desire. So he's repeating Psalm 40, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. That's the first covenant. Then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first covenant, let me add, that he may establish the second covenant that we studied last week. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He's saying when we believe the truth that Jesus died for us, we are also set apart to be God's people to accomplish God's task for our lives. He sanctified himself so that we would be sanctified. Now, big word, right? Big old Pastor Chet used old propitiation, whatever that word was. And now you're talking about sanctification. I don't even, I've never heard that word before. It's my second time at church. Sanctification, propitiation. I mean, all of these words. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to make it simple for all of us, including myself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we've got a beautiful definition of sanctification. You see, earlier in, these, earlier in, the, in, in the chapter, it speaks and makes a list of sins. And then he says this, and such, look carefully, were some of you. You used to practice those sins, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So let me explain sanctification. We're no longer like the world. We used to be. But now it doesn't feel comfortable. Like, I used to go to the bars all the time. I, I didn't. But I used to go to the bars all the time. Let me speak as if I did. I used to go to the bars all the time. Now when I go to the bar, I don't go to the bar. But now when I go to the bar, I feel funny. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I should be sitting here. I used to have a potty mouth. I didn't have a potty mouth, but I'm just saying, I used to have a potty mouth, but now if I use a potty word, ooh, I just don't feel, and when I hear a potty word, it never used to bother me before. In fact, I used to use potty words as adjectives, verbs, nouns, and adjectives. I mean, but now when I hear a potty word, oh, potty word, potty word. Something happens when Christ comes inside of you, the things that you were used to and even loved to do, now they bother you and you can't believe that you used to do that. You know why? Sanctified means we're set apart to be like Jesus. We're becoming more and more like Jesus every day. And Jesus doesn't use potty words. And if Jesus goes to a bar... He doesn't have one too many. Probably doesn't even have one. Do you understand if Jesus is amongst sinners, they go, something is different about him. Amen. Can the world say that of you? Are you sanctified? 
In Hebrews chapter 10. Now let's pick it up there in verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. And so once again now, we've seen this uh, several times in the book of Hebrews. He's comparing the Jewish religion, the priestly religion, to Jesus Christ. Once again, verse 11, every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man... After, speaking of Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, in other words, he died on the cross and rose again, sat down at the right hand of God from, the time, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Stop there for just a minute. Once again, the author reminds us that the priests had nowhere to sit. Take a look at it again. You may have passed right over it. And every priest stands ministering, but this man, verse 12, once he did his, he sat down at the right hand of God. Stand and sat, those are two very important words. The reason why the priest could not sit down in the temple is because the work of covering over sin could never be finished. That's why the priest had to go in year after year. Hey, see you this time next year, Shimon. Like, I mean, it's just they had to go back in year after year. It was a reminder that they're just a sinner. And there was no place to sit in the temple except the mercy seat, which was empty because Jesus had not yet come. Jesus, once he died, the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Well, let me tell you what the author is saying. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he say, his last words? It is finished. I don't got to work anymore. I don't have to go to work anymore. Can you imagine? <laughs> you get a letter from your boss? We're going to pay you for the rest of your life. You never have to show up for work again. Somebody say, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I would sit down on my little comfy chair and lift up my feet. <laughs> I got a paycheck coming. I don't have to worry about a blessed thing. Now, let me tell you, Jesus is working. I don't want you to think that when you pray, he's like, oh, I'm taking a break. I'm watching football today. That's not my point. What I'm trying to get across to you, when Jesus says it is finished, he doesn't need to keep dying again and again and again. See, the Bible makes it clear that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we're saved. You don't have to worry about your salvation. In fact, there's nothing you have to do for your salvation because Jesus is sitting down in heaven and he says, it's finished. I did it for you. You know the scripture. If not, this is, a, this is one you put on your fridge and you memorize. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. When someone walks down and they say, dear Jesus, Please forgive me of my sin. It's coming from, you should see the tears up here. It's coming straight from their heart. And what's in their heart is coming out of their mouth. It's a prayer of faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift. Can you imagine at Christmas time? Okay, before anyone opens up their gifts, 20 bucks. That's not a gift. That's a sale. It's not a gift. It's a sale. I've actually thought about doing it a couple of Christmases. <laughs> Sorry, if you can put that verse back up on there for me. There you go. It's a gift of God, not of works. Let me ask you a question. Thief on the cross, what did he do? Did he get down off the cross, help an old lady across the street? Got to have one good work to get to heaven. Did he come off the cross and get baptized? No. Now, baptism is the first step of obedience. But the thief didn't have an opportunity. Baptism is an evidence of our salvation. It doesn't cause us to be saved. There's nothing we can do to be saved. Because Jesus did the work, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
I've been to Liberia. How many of you have been there? I've been to Iran twice. I have prayed all around Freedom Square. Who's ever done that? In Tehran. <laughs> Can you imagine if we started comparing ourselves to who's saved and who's not? Well, well, I go to work at Ralph's every single day. I guarantee you God probably looks at that as more faithful than me going to Iran. Because God knows human beings. And if we could work ourselves to heaven, do you know our church on this side would be like the, the missionary side? And here, this would be like the Harvest Festival volunteer side. And I gave 10 hours. Well, I gave 15. Well, I gave 20. Well, I'm like Adonis. I'm here 64-7 or whatever it is. <laughs> Can you imagine? I go to church twice a week. Well, I go three times. In fact, I go to four different churches four times a week. <laughs> well, I lead worship. Oh, you lead worship? I make a joyful noise. <laughs> well, you just stand there, but I dance. <laughs> I'm, more, I'm so much more saved than you. In fact, when we get to heaven, you're Harlem, I'm Bel Air. I'm just telling you how it is. <laughs> he knows human beings. So we aren't saved by our works. We're saved by grace. But what I love about this passage is since he died on the cross, sitting at the right hand of the Father, verse 13, from that time, uh, from that time till his enemies are made his footstool. Can I say something? Jesus has no worries for the future. He knows he's victorious. He's just patiently waiting in absolute con confidence that the work on the cross has given him victory. So there he is sitting at the right hand of God just waiting for his enemies to be his footstool. Let me tell you about the cross. Paul says it so much better than me. It's Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Take a look. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. In other words, this was heaven at the cross. Ha, 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 fooled ya. He made a public, you thought you won, but you lost. Take a look at 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That happened on the cross. Listen to Jesus' own words. In John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus says this, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. He's absolutely confident that he has the victory. His confidence of victory, can I tell you, Christian, listen carefully, is available for you today. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the Bible says faith is the victory that overcomes the world. You have victory. Are you choosing to live in it? Because that's the point of Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The evidence of our salvation is our desire to be more like Christ. And when there comes a day that we're not acting like Christ, it grieves us. You see, positionally, we're sanctified. The blood of Jesus has made us perfect. There's nothing we have to do to be saved. He's made us perfect. But what the writer of Hebrews is letting us know, practically, we're being made holy each and every day. In fact, the writer is making it clear that the evidence of your salvation is that you're becoming more and more like Jesus. That's sanctification. Let me show it to you. It's John 17. Listen to what Jesus prayed for us. He says this, sanctify them by your truth. 
Your word is truth. Which one of you would have come up with when someone forces you to go one mile, go two? Which one of you would have come up with that one? You're so good-hearted that when a Roman soldier straps a load on your back, you look at them at the end of a mile and go, can I just go one more mile for you? Which one of us would have come up with when someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other to him also? I never would have come up with that. Mine would have been when someone slaps you on the cheek, slap them back. <laughs> Let them feel it and give your backhand. Swing as hard as you can. You know why? I'm a sinner. And sinner come up with sinful things to do. But Jesus is the light of the world. And he gives us things. And he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As we learn the truth, it's what you're doing here on a Thursday night. You're learning the truth. Now, you've got a purpose to put the truth into action. Sanctify them by your truth. Look what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Therefore, if anyone does cleanses himself from the latter, sinful things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. What does he say? Cleanse yourself from the latter. Cleanse yourself from sin. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, put off the old man and put on the new. If you're comfortable with sin, there's a spiritual problem. Because John says, if you're truly born again, you have a love for people and you practice righteousness. You don't practice sin. That's the DNA of God when you're born again. You love people, even ordinary people, even stubborn people, all kinds of people, smelly people. You love every kind, of, like you look at people and you just go, oh, I was talking to our Disciple Life students the other day and there was a guy in uh, uh, the, the weekend services and he had some questions and as I was looking at him, he's kind of debating back and forth with me. I just looked at him and I thought, oh, I did. I love him. And I thought to myself, so this is what I do, just to let you know, when someone ornery comes up to me. I imagine them to be a 95-year-old blind woman trying to cross I-5. That's what I do. I, I, that's what I have to do in my mind. Because when you see a 95-year-old blind woman trying to cross I-5, what do you do? Hit her? No. You stop your car and you're like, lady, what are you doing? Like, we've got to get off the road here. I mean, we got, I got to help you out. I got to stop traffic. I got to get you off the road. You see, I love people. So I've come up with systems in my mind that even when there's ordinary people or people that don't agree or people that have an issue, that I try to love them with everything I've got. And sometimes when you're hard to love or I'm hard to love, you know what I pray? Jesus, just love through me because it ain't happening with me right now. I'm just honest with God. Help me out. I need to love like you. You know why I do that? Because I love Jesus, and I love what he's done for me, and I want to be like him each and every day. I don't want to be comfortable with hatred because that's not a reflection of God, and I don't want to be comfortable with sin because that's not being sanctified. <laughs> now, Jesus sets the example of this. Do you remember what he said? A body you prepared for me. I've come to do your will, O oh God. Let me tell you about Jesus. Positionally, he was the king of kings when he was born. Positionally. Okay? Charles, God bless him, how long did he wait? I mean, Elizabeth, she just decided to live forever. <laughs> and now Charles was always going to be the king, but he didn't become the king until his mom, God rest her soul, passed away. But he was the king. In position, he was the king. But he wasn't the king in practice until something happened. You see, we are children of the king. We are positionally sanctified. But we've got to work out our sanctification each and every day day because the, Jesus was born the king of kings he was sanctified from birth but he sanctified himself 
through obedience on the cross. Do you remember what he said in John 17? Now I sanctify myself so that they can be sanctified. I know I'm the king positionally, but I'm choosing to be obedient even to the point of death, the death on a cross. Verse 15, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make. Now I want to stop there for a minute. The Holy Spirit witnesses. So the writer is giving credit to the Holy Spirit for the book of Jeremiah. Because the Holy Spirit wrote the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was just the hand that the Spirit used. So he says the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds... Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Let me explain what he's saying here. The author is confirming that Jesus has ushered in the new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of in the Old Testament. And he's detailing the provisions of the covenant. And the first of his, he has sanctified us. And the way that he communicates it is, their sin and lawless deeds I'll remember no more. When I look at you positionally, I won't remember any of your sin. So when some of you were smokers, okay, (laughs) can't believe it. Some of you are still smoking. we got to talk about that. (laughs) Some of you had potty mouths. Some of you were fornicators. Ooh. Some of you were slanderers. Some of you were gossipers. You just loved to talk bad about people to make yourself look better. Some of you were frustrated and angry all the time. (laughs) You were just mean. That's what you were. But you're not like that anymore. So when you go to God, you don't have to do this. Lord, I'm so sorry. I used to have such a potty mouth. He's forgiven you of that. Lord, I I was a fornicator. He forgave you of that. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. You're, you're, You're clean. Do you remember what Jesus told Peter? Peter, he goes, hey, can I wash your feet? Uh, no, Jesus, that's too humiliating. I'm not letting you wash my feet. Okay, then you have no part of me. Wash my whole body. Please give me a bath, Jesus. And what did he say? You're clean. I only need to wash your feet. Because Jesus knows positionally we're sanctified, but sometimes we've got to make it right because we've sinned as a believer. And he's got to clean us up. So positionally, he says, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore. You don't have to feel guilty about who you were. Such were some of you. But another uh, provision of the covenant, he is sanctifying us. What does he say in the covenant? I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds. In other words, we learn the word of God. Your word is... Your, uh, uh, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You're here on a Thursday night. You learn the word. And then you go out into the world and you're about to use a potty word. I don't know. I, some of you might be struggling with potty words. I don't know. But it's, been, it's not even in my notes. So I don't even know where it came from. We never, even, we never even used it in our home, potty words. Maybe your family did. I don't know. But we just said, you can't say that. Okay? Now listen. You go out and you're about to go body word. And the spirit goes, don't do it. Don't let it come out of your mouth. You learned last Thursday that potty words are sinful. Don't let it come out of your mouth. So you go, God bless you. God bless you and you and God bless all you people. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Now you're like blessing yourself. God, help me. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. The Spirit of God goes, don't do it inside of you. And you're responding. But you used to do it all the time. And you could 
care less. The Spirit is changing you. He's sanctifying you. Do you know what this is called? This is called the law of the Spirit. This is called walking in the Spirit. When we're sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. I thought I was going to get much further, but I'm not going to go any further. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, he says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And we're going to take this passage next week. But he's concluding all of chapter 7 and 10, then in, there in verse 19. And what he's trying to get across is, we can have a relationship with God because of Jesus. So here's how I want to close. This was an overwhelming thought for the first century Jew. Because their view of God was smoking mountains. And I wonder if the writer in the 21st century world is trying to get across to us, maybe we should just be as overwhelmed. I can't believe because of Jesus, I have a personal, I can just say, dear Jesus, that I'm in the throne room. And I wonder if you're taking advantage of it or you're taking it for granted. Tonight, are you overwhelmed that you have a personal relationship with the God who said, Saturn, Neptune, Earth, sun, black hole, zebra, manatee. <laughs> Leopard. <laughs> Worm. <laughs> Mosquito. <laughs> Elephant. You. You have a relationship with a God. Do you know that in your body you have over a hundred miles of veins and arteries? And you get to go, dear Jesus, you have a personal relationship with God, but I wonder, I wonder, if when he wants to have a personal relationship with you, you're too busy. I'm too busy. When he knocks on our heart's door, don't use the potty word, we just ignore him. When he beckons us to say, I'd like some time with you. Are you overwhelmed with the thought you have a personal relationship with the living God. I guarantee it would affect the way you worship. You'd go from a pocket swayer to a hand lifter. I guarantee it will affect the way you talk at work. I guarantee it'll, be, it'll affect the way you look at your husband or your wife. I guarantee if you recognized how personal your relationship with God is, any time you go against him, you'll feel it. Are you overwhelmed? Father, thank you so much for your great grace. That after over 2,000 years of knowing this truth, I pray as it was just as awe-inspiring for them it would be for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me? Now listen, if you're a pocket person, there's no judgment at our church. We just know we have some work to do. No, listen, it doesn't matter what you look like, it matters what happens in your heart. 
And why did you get into the throne room with this last song? Just get into the throne room. Say, dear Jesus. Right? And when you say his name, you get ushered right behind the veil into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God by faith. If you believe that, then behave it as we talk to Jesus now.